Hi, it's June the 11th, 2020, and welcome to the Water Action Platform. You can see that we're using a different platform for this webinar, uh, and it's been created by our friends at Andi. And in a moment, I'm going to hand over to the Chief Executive of Andi, Martin Curry, and he's going to talk you through how you can raise questions and, and how you can engage better with this platform. So, Martin, over to you. Thanks, Pierce. I tend to think of myself more as Andi's janitor, and I'm here today to take you through the housekeeping. So you might have noticed, uh, if you scroll down below the video, that there's an invitation to enter your nickname. I'm going to call myself Martin, because that's my name. And then you get to agree that you can be polite and courteous, uh, read through the privacy policy. Now, I've read it before, so I'll skip through that. And uh, then you can join. And now I can say something. Hello, uh, Water Action Platform. And I can hit the purple aeroplane to send that to the platform. Now, I might want to ask Pierce a question. So why not try, um, what is your favorite pathogen? There we go. Be interested to hear that one. And then you hit, instead of the purple aeroplane, you hit the sort of cyan-coloured question mark, and then that marks it as a question. Excellent. Let's have some more questions. What can we ask Pierce? Uh, when did you first, oh, first fall in love with water? Oh, another typo. Sorry. Uh, right, and you can just hit, oh no. Don't hit enter. Uh, you can hit enter to put in a normal chat, but I really wanted this to be a question. But never fear, you can hit this three dot up here and you can mark that as a question. And then that becomes a question as well. Now these questions, they all end up going in here. So if you click on this question mark, uh, you get these questions. And my favourite one was this, okay? And we can all vote on the questions in this screen. And uh, if I hit this refresh, it now sorts them in order of the questions. So that's wonderful. But let's say during the course of, of the webinar, Pierce actually mentions that his favourite pathogen is uh, Cryptosporidium or whatever. I could then, so that it seems like I have been paying attention, I could mark this question as answered and it will then turn green and that means that we won't be asking that of Pierce at the end in the Q&A. So that's pretty much most of it. You can return to chat here. You can as well with the dot 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 thing, you can delete your message, uh, mark it as answered or change it. And one last thing that I'd really like to show you is this. If you go into the hamburger icon here and go pop out, that will get you a full screen version of the chat. Basically, my preference is to watch the chat on the big screen and then go into exactly the same URL on my phone and then do the pop out on my phone and I get it nice and big there and I can type in my questions to Pierce. Wonderful. Um, back to you, Pierce. Thank you very much, Martin. Right, without further ado, let's crack on. So we always start with an overview of who's in the group. And I thought this time last night when we were preparing these slides, I thought we were gonna pass the 700 people. We're not, we were at 696, but overnight we've just pushed over the uh, 700 mark. So the group is growing uh, and thank you for your continued input. As you know, we've got a full uh, WhatsApp group of 256 people on the main um, COVID-19 group, but we've got a number of subgroups, some of which are specific to COVID-19, such as the WASH services or the SARS in wastewater, SARS COVID-2 in wastewater, and some are much broader and they cover not just COVID-19 uh, aspects, but, um, but other wider day-to-day -day operational aspects, such as the asset management and leakage um, uh, groups. And then we've got a couple of groups on uh, chemical free treatment and customer service, both of which are in their stages of just being formed. We haven't quite got to critical mass. If you want to join any of these groups, just send me or Megan an email. Now, I'd like to give a little advert for what we're going to talk about a little later when uh, at the end, halfway through this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit more about the SARS COVID-2 in wastewater group because we've got some particularly exciting news there. Last week, you might recall, uh, we talked about how there was a desperate need to find the dose 
uh, um, response relationship for the RNA in sewage so that we could better interpret the data that's being uh, produced and understand whether if we see a concentration of X of RNA, what that translates to in terms of the population, the local community who've, uh, who've, who are infected. But we can't do that without this dose relationship um, uh, curve. We've got some news on that, which I'll share with you a little bit later. We've also got some more um, worrying news around the vector transmission uh, potential of sewage. And I'll give you an update on that too. But we like to start with an infographic and uh, I thought I'd share this little infographic. It was one around the benefits of working from home. And you can see here uh, a survey that shows that most people love the flexibility benefit from home, from working from home, but they're not so sure if you flick on the disbenefits, they're not so sure about the fact that there's a blurred line between uh, when you're at work and when you're at home. And I hope if that's a description of you, uh, you're, um, you're, you're managing to sort it properly. There is a lot more data from that particular survey and the information is on the slide deck. Uh, so you'll get to see that um, uh, if you uh, look at the slides later. The agenda for the next 20 minutes or so is I'm going to cover the highlights of the week. I'm going to jump through the first three items very quickly, which is a case study of Puerto Rico, the five rules for how to live in a post COVID-19 world and some of the opportunities for looking at different service models. And then I want to spend a little bit more time talking about a broad range of topics which I've captured under the what, what's the role of a modern water utility in a post COVID-19 world. And then secondly, we'll cover off talking about the SARS-CoV-2 uh, in wastewater, as I've just mentioned. And then at the very end, uh, some people have asked me to repeat some of the 12 highlights uh, of, um, uh, from the last 12 months, last 12 weeks. And so I'll cover that as well. So if we start with the case study from Puerto Rico. Well, the work that's presented here has basically come from RCAP, the Rural, Rural Community Assistance Partnership, who did a uh, a survey, they actually did a survey across all of North America, but it included, the, uh, included Puerto Rico. And uh, they were particularly looking at rural communities. And the reason I flagged it is because of all the responses in Puerto Rico, none of those communities, and there were many of them, 20 plus, uh, none of them served anything more than 500 people. And actually the great majority of them, all but two, um, identified that actually they got real real problems with their financial viability over the over the coming months and the reason this is important is because for most of us we have a neighboring utility if we were a small utility we've got a neighboring utility that's maybe big enough to su support us if we get into trouble and in puerto rico i think this shines a light on the fact of the fragility of that particular uh, water and sanitation um, system and you can see from this graphic you know, this is puerto rico there's the dots showing who's responded only two are green. Everyone else either hasn't got the data or knows that they've got problems. That's the case study on Puerto Rico. I share, said I'd share with you the five rules for a safer um, uh, world post COVID-19. And this is work shared by SIWI done in, in partnership with UNICEF. And what I liked about this, and there's lots of rules that have been shared over the, over the last few months. Um, what I liked about these was that they were particularly practical and they were both short and medium term. So if we look at them, they've got the broad statement that we'd all agree with on, on raise public awareness about public hygiene, uh, hand hygiene. But actually them saying, you know, don't just repeat the message of wash your hands. Look at some behavioral research that's been going on, behavioral change research, and use, use that information to make sure that your messages are particularly um, pertinent and, and heard. They also talk about strengthening infection and uh, in infection prevention and control. And the point they make there is that this is about providing uninterrupted service. There's no point in providing a water and sanitation service to people for eight hours of the day uh, if for the other whatever it is, 16 hours of the day, people are exposed um, uh, to the risks that you're, you're trying to protect them from. The other rules they've got guarantee that everyone has access to a minimum level of water and sanitation. And the point they make there is this means keeping the, the public toilets open. Again, you, there's no point in providing water to people to wash their hands if actually they can't uh, defecate in, in clean environments. And then of course, there's the ensuring the continuity and safety of water and sanitation services. And that last one, providing practical and financial support to water utilities, which I'm sure everybody on this webinar is going, it will, that will resonate with them. Moving on to the next thing, which was around, what does the, this pandemic mean in terms of service operations and different 
types of models for, for how people are going to operate in the future. Well, many municipalities are struggling to provide their water services, uh, in particular to informal settlements, shanty towns and slums. And what we're seeing is a surge of new types of um, provisions, new services. Now, there's a few listed on this slide of Wonder Kid and City Taps, who've got um, smart prepay meters that will provide water to some of these communities. Sanergy is actually on the sanitation side. They've got containerized solutions which provide wastewater distributed wastewater services to, to these communities where they take the waste, and I love this, they actually take the waste, treat it centrally, and then convert it into not just a fertilizer, but also an insect-based animal feed, um, which is more than, than many developed countries do. And then we find ourselves also, uh, this pandemic is driving us towards embracing more digital solutions. And so Drinkwell, uh, which is a social enterprise they're working um, with uh, in, in Dakar with the local water utility. And they've essentially developed um, water ATMs, places where people can go and access water. And, and importantly here, they can access water at utility prices because the local water vendors are often charging 10 to 15 times more than you would get if you were getting water from a pipe supply. So the very poorest people in society are in the end paying much more for their water than, uh, than those who can afford it, um, afford to have a pipe supply. Now we move to um, the bigger issue that I wanted to cover. And as I said earlier, we've taken a lot of the chat that's been happening this last week and blended it together into this general thesis of what's the role of a modern water utility in a post-COVID world? And I start with this research here from uh, Colin McFarlane, Professor Colin McFarlane from Durham University. And he's been, he's wrote a really good paper where he's asked the question, who? Who are we designing our cities to serve? Because he's flagged up that actually the people who are suffering most from this pandemic are those who are living in the most dense populated areas. And he cites New York, where you can see the highest number of cases per capita are in the areas of New York, where they have the lowest incomes and the largest households, where there's the greatest density of people living. He also uses the examples in Birmingham, here in the UK, we've got the same thing. 70% more cases are happening in, the, in those areas where there's dense populations living. However, he then flags up and says, it is an oversimplification to say that high population density is what's driving the, the, the more people to suffer from this disease. Because we've got many examples, Singapore, Taipei, Hong Kong, where cities are hugely densely populated, but actually they're not suffering in the same way that we're seeing in some of these other areas. And the problem, he says, is not the high density of population, but it's the imbalance between good quality urban provisions, things such as housing, water utilities, infrastructure, and the population density. And he calls this the, the, the sort of population index that we're seeing, and that the poorer neighborhoods are, are suffering because of the infrastructure that's around them. Um, now, my point here is that when we started this pandemic, governments told us that this pandemic was going to be, um, it, it didn't differentiate. Um, uh, and what we're seeing is that it does, it does discriminate. The poorest people in society are suffering much more than the people who are, are wealthier and able to, um, to not be exposed to the, the, the vectors that cause the, the transmission. And this has direct implications to water utilities and how we operate. So, um, just building on this sort of little thesis, I mentioned at the beginning with the Puerto Rican um, trial that some of the stuff that's been going on, the surveys have been going on in North America. Now, as well as looking at Puerto Rico, they looked at over a thousand communities across all of North America, 49 states, I'm assuming they didn't use Alaska, uh, and including some of the tribal um, states. And actually what they've shown there is that 30% of those communities will not be able to survive. 30% of the utilities there will not be able to survive if the current conditions uh, last for more than three, five, three, four, five months uh, more. They also, and this is the really terrifying bit, was that 43% of those um, communities are basically reliant upon one person to maintain and keep their, their water and sanitation services running. And that there's a growing concern that what happens if that person falls ill? This again comes down to the fragility of these particular ecosystems, these particular communities, and the water services that are being provided to them. Um, now, if we move on, Rachel Cooper at the University of Birmingham has written a spectacular paper uh, covering the issues of COVID-19 on the urban poor, not the rural poor, the urban poor. Now, all I've done here is I picked out four of the key messages that she's putting because I thought they were particularly relevant to this, this discussion. First of all, she says that the poor service provision 
prior to or during a crisis will directly impact a customer's willingness to pay. And she cites the example of what happened in South Africa in 2018 with the drought there. The city of Cape Town tried to impose a drought levy and it was rejected by the public because they just didn't feel they'd been getting good enough service. And actually what's then happened is tariffs have gone up threefold in order to recover the costs that were lost there. Secondly, she makes the point that appropriate tariff structures, appropriate, that's the key word, appropriate tariff structures can do two things. They can both support the poorest in society, but also enable a water utility to be um, financially viable. And their point here is that what you've really got to do is you've got to be clever in designing your tariffs. You've got to make it so that the richest people in society and maybe some of the commercial clients are cross subsidizing some of the poorest um, because otherwise the system becomes um, broken. Going on, she makes the point that um, COVID-19 actually may increase domestic water consumption in some areas which are already hugely stressed by water. And she actually cites a 2018 drought that happened uh, around Loka Reservoir, which I think is in Ghana. Um, uh, and actually the government's response there was to dig 44 boreholes, uh, actually compounding the very issue that was there, you know, digging more boreholes to drain even more water out of an area that was um, was already severely water stressed wasn't the right solution but it was a knee-jerk reaction that we need to be very thoughtful about what it is we're going to do. And then finally we come to this whole question of free water. What's the right answer? Do we provide free water to the poorest people in society or do we do social tariffs? And, and um, Rachel makes the point here that actually it doesn't actually benefit the poorest and often this is because the poorest aren't on um, pipe networks. So actually giving them free water, you're actually not reaching out to the very poorest people in society. Now, she does then go on to list um, measures that could be taken to support them. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them, apart from noting this third one on this slide, which is build back better. I think that's a thought that as we all come out of this lockdown and come through this, this virus, um, we've got to think about how do we better build our infrastructure so that it's going to be more resilient for the next um, pandemic. Now we come to the question of, are the governments actually helping? COVID-19 has thrown up so many vulnerabilities in our society. And uh, as governments do everything they can to flatten that curve, what we've got is people into lockdown. And that's resulting in, as you can see here, the IMF showing that 90% of countries they expect will go into pretty severe uh, negative GDP growth. And if you thought that was bad going forward, just look at that graph showing the countries over the last 10 years. There's a list there of half a dozen countries in Africa showing the proportion of people who had water, uh, safe sanitation in 2007 and safe sanitation in 2017. And the resounding feature from that graph is that they got worse over that 10 year period. So if you compound that into the fact that we're now going into this global economic crisis, if it was bad for the last 10 years, what is it going to be like for the next? So there are things we can do. And again, there's a list of them here. Digitise payments, fix the leaks that are most urgent. But the overriding one that people keep coming back to is should we provide free water to the poorest people in society? And we've listed out a few countries here and just literally put a sentence against a number of countries across Africa because governments are doing similar things, but slightly different. And you can see the detail there uh, on these two slides. But what now throws is that whilst that might be appropriate in that circumstance, it's not appropriate everywhere else. And actually, for some countries, we're coming back to normal. So here is an example from Saudi Arabia, where the National Water Company, which is one of the largest water utilities in the world, it serves over 30 million people. They are resuming action uh, against people who don't pay. Um, and that's probably appropriate for Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, and this is a situation that I think many countries are going to be watching to see how the situation lands in Saudi Arabia. They started re, re fining people for not paying uh, earlier this week, and uh, we'll see how that plays out. And you can see the GWI survey showed that 75% of utilities around the world um, uh, have currently suspended action against non payers. Which leads me to my last slide on this little section. It comes back to the are the government measures actually helping and what can we do to make things better? And, and it's this, that, that bullet point highlighted in red halfway down this slide, which shows that some research from the World Bank, which showed that 56% of the subsidies which we are, uh, are putting out to the poorest people in society 
are being taken up by the top 20%. So the majority of the subsidies that are going out there are actually being accessed by the people who least need them, while only 6% of the subsidies um, benefit the bottom 20%. It is completely uh, on its head. Which brings me to this heartfelt plea, really, to everyone listening to this webinar. You're probably working inside a water utility. And and the role that we have as water utilities as being part of that backbone, part of that journey that goes back to the, the professor from Durham University who highlighted that difference of um, uh, inequality. And that's what's driving people to suffer most from this disease, to be most exposed is the inequalities. And our ability in the water sector is very strong for addressing that balance. We can't solve it all, but we can make a significant impact. And I ask you to consider what within your organisation you could maybe do better or do differently. We now come to the next item, which is uh, the wastewater-based epidemiology findings. And I flagged these at the beginning of this webinar, where I said, you know, it's all about understanding that dose response curve for measuring the RNA in the sewage, the inactive RNA in the sewage. And there's lots of work that's been going on. We've presented on it previously, and it's all around the world. It's beautiful, the number of, of research communities that are gathering together. However, and there's always a however here, there, isn't, there hasn't been enough work done to compare the alternative methodologies. So what we've got is we've got different groups of people doing research, but we're not able to compare them and actually get true leverage from, our, from that data and, and make some interpretations. And this is why it's been nigh on impossible to compare data from different research groups. Well, that situation, I am delighted to tell you, we've taken a significant step to changing in the last week. There's been a paper that's been released, you can see the title of it here, uh, published in Science and Total Environment, written by Ahmed et al. And this is an evaluation of seven different types of um, wastewater, seven different types methodologies for um, concentrating um, uh, or for calculating the RNA in wastewater. And they've been using uh, something called the murine hepatitis virus, MHV, which is a great surrogate. They've been able to prove that this is a great surrogate for, um, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, MHV only infects mice, it doesn't infect humans, and that in itself is great news because it means that actually laboratories which are not um, uh, licensed to do human pathogens can actually still contribute into this work because it's not a human pathogen. So we've got a great sort of opportunity there. Now this graphic is, is wonderful. When I was writing research papers, we didn't have this. We didn't try and summarize our research paper in a single graphic, but this is what they, people appear to do now. And here's a beautiful graphic which summarizes the whole paper and shows the, the seven different treatments that were done and how they came through. But if you prefer words, here's the words. What they basically concluded was that the absorption extraction methods, either with or without magnesium chloride, were the best ways of uh, concentrating up the MHV. Now, if you actually look, the, the recovery rates were broad. You know, it was from 25% up to 65% uh, recovery rate. So there's a significant difference in, in how these different methods work. And now that we've got this, uh, this finding, hopefully we can take a, a major leap forward in gathering more of that data, which will get us to that all important dose response curve, which is a crucial part of the puzzle if we're ever to use um, uh, the monitoring of the RNA in sewage as, a, um, as a, an early warning system. However, this leads on to a bit of less good news, which is we have been saying from the very beginning, there's been talk around, is sewage a transmission risk for the virus? And actually, we've said confidently that it is not the case, that there is not a risk, um, uh, because there's been no data showing that fecal oral transmission. Apart from the last couple of weeks, there's been murmurs, whispers, a few experts saying, well, maybe the viral load in the environment's increased to a level that perhaps there's an aerosolized risk, but there has been no hard data. And then this week, a paper was uh, circulated. It has not yet been peer reviewed. It's come from some um, uh, uh, researchers in Bangladesh working uh, in collaboration with researchers in Australia. And they've considered reclaimed wastewater and raw sewage, and they've come to this very bold statement. They've said, the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus is now perceived as an enteric pathogen and has been found to remain stable in wastewater for days. Now that statement is incredibly dangerous. If it is true, it's incredibly worrying. If it's not true, it's incredibly dangerous. So we took it upon ourselves to do some research into this, and we've actually spoken to a number of uh, leading experts and flagged this paper with them and got their opinion. And it is our opinion that this, these statements are wrong and they are misleading. Now, just as the previous paper had a beautiful uh, infographic uh, summarizing its findings, 
this paper has an infographic I don't find beautiful. Uh, you can see here, you probably can't read the detail, but the red and the green, basically they've looked at grey water and they've looked at sewage. And where it's red, they're saying there's an issue, and where it's green, they're saying it's fine. Now, we believe that those two statements they made about there being enteric, um, that it's an enteric pathogen, and secondly, that it survives for days in sewage are not true. SARS-CoV-2 is not generally perceived to be an enteric pathogen, and there is no evidence of a faecal oral transmission risk that's been reported to date. And there is no direct evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 virions, this is the active part of the virus, those virions are not surviving inside sewage. The RNA does, but the RNA is inactive. It's the virions which we need to worry about. So why has there been a difference of opinion? Well, it's exactly as I've just said. We, uh, we believe there's been a misunderstanding of that data. The two, all of the papers, and we've, had, we've published at least 10 that we've talked about in previous webinars, um, have talked about the RNA and the virions. And this has not been picked up on this paper. So why am I flagging it here? Well, I'm flagging it here because we're all in a world where news like this can come back and be incredibly dangerous for us. And we need to be confident and clear about managing it. I don't think it's deliberate fake news. I suspect it's probably just a bit of, forgive me for saying it, bad science. But and hopefully this paper, when it gets peer reviewed, will not be reviewed. But because it, of how papers are published nowadays, it is actually out there. It's in the public. Um, and so we need to be aware of it. Finally, um, I was asked if I could share my 12 key takeaways uh, from the past three months. And I've put them, I've re repeated them on this slide. I don't intend to go through them because you can read them. But, but someone did say to me, well, what's your favourite one from all of these? And, you know, we've covered lots of them around how you recycle PPE and what do you do with managing the shift workers. My favourite is actually the first one. It's around lockdown and around the need to, um, to act quickly. Timing is paramount. Make decisions, inform decisions, but make them quickly and don't cogitate. Um, We've also, as I flick through these slides, you can see the other things that we've learned around the funding crisis that's coming. We've learned about the impact of technology. We've learned that you need to support your customers better. And we've particularly that number 12 there, this whole work around SARS-CoV-2 as a potential early indicator for wastewater has been a phenomenally exciting area. Now, that brings me to the end of this webinar. I'd just like to say thank you to all our sponsors. As you know, the Water Action Platform, which is what the, 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 the WhatsApp group has morphed into, it's open for all and it's free at the point of use. And the only reason we've been able to do that has been because of the generosity of these organisations who are sponsoring us. So thank you to them. Um, please, if you're interested in participating more, in, join us on any one of the subgroups that we've mentioned. We're going to hold another one of these webinars in two weeks time, not in one week's time, it's in two weeks. So we're dropping them out to every fortnight. Um, and for those of you who tried to log on to this morning's webinar, I apologize for some of the technical glitches that we experienced then. Um, the reason we've just pre-recorded this, this isn't running live. This was pre-recorded about an hour before it's being shown. Um, was to try and avoid some of those glitches, but I am online. And so if you uh, if you type any questions online, I'll, I'm there and I will be able to respond directly to them. And of course, this video will be available uh, afterwards um, for anyone who, who has a particular desire to watch it a second time. With that, I'd just like to wish you a great week. And I say, please keep asking questions. Please keep sharing. And please keep safe. Thank you.